Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is David Mossberg. I am uh, Secretary of State uh, Robert Rodriguez designee uh, to sit on the New York State Hearing Aid Advisory Board. Uh, for those attending, this is uh, an open meeting being held remotely. Uh, the remote meeting is being conducted in accordance with the governor's executive orders relating to the COVID-19 pandemic as authorized by Chapter 417 of the Laws of 2001, Chapter 1 of the Laws of 2022, and Part WW of Chapter 56 of the Laws of 2022. Um, I will open the meeting um, by taking a roll call. Um, so if um, the, when I call your name, if you could just say present for the record, Jerry Bergman. Here. Peter Fisher. I think Peter's on mute. Uh, Peter. Oh, Peter Fisher's here. Okay. Eric Freeman. Eric's on mute again. Eric. Here. Uh, Sharon Gavin. There's there's feedback coming from um, your device, Sharon. So I'm gonna unmute. I'm gonna Thank mute you. you. But if you uh, need to speak or like to say something, just put something in the chat or signal, and we'll unmute you. Uh, Dr. Anna Kim. Be here. She is here. Um, I, I don't see. She, she doesn't have the video. She's having difficulty with that. Um, she said she's having a hard time logging onto the video and audio. And um, I don't see a way to unmute I see, her. I see a box for her, but I don't see. Yeah, she she's signed in, but not connected to video or audio yet. Mike, do you think that maybe you can help her in chat? Uh, yeah, we can we can chat and see what we can do for. Her. Okay, uh, Marianne Dupon Wabley. Present. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Uh, Jason Kramer on behalf of the Commissioner of uh, State Education Department. <clears throat> okay. Um, Dr. Alashir on behalf of the Commissioner of the Department of Health. Dr. Alashir. President, I'm sorry. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, Brant Campbell on behalf of the Attorney General's Office. Hi, good afternoon. Um, hi, <laughs> thank you. Um, so, uh, here's as if we have a quorum. Uh, so we'll move on to the agenda items for today. Uh, the first item on the agenda is welcoming uh, the new representative from the Office of the Attorney General, uh, Brant Campbell. Um, Brant, I don't know if you'd like to make an introduction or say something to the board, but um, certainly welcome and give you the opportunity uh, to say hello. Sure, thank you for that opportunity. I'm pleased to serve on behalf of uh, Attorney General James and uh, in the office and I've been with the Attorney General's office for 17 years now. I work in the Healthcare Bureau, um, so I am happy for this opportunity. Okay, uh, welcome and we look forward to working uh, closely with you. Um, the next item on the agenda 1B is the approval and review of the meeting minutes from March 21st, 2022. Um, posted on the website and provided to all the board members in advance of uh, the meeting was that summary. Um, so I don't know if there's anyone who has uh, questions or comments from the board. Did, did all the board members have an opportunity to review the minutes? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, will one of the voting members of the board uh, like to make a motion uh, to approve the minutes from the last summary? I'll make a motion to approve. Okay. Um, I'll second it. 
Thank you. Uh, any board members uh, oppose? Okay. Uh, there being a motion seconded uh, to approve the minutes with no opposition. Uh, the meeting minutes from 321-2022 are approved. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the public hearing pursuant to Part WW of Chapter 56 of the Laws of 2022. The proposed resolution authorizing the use of video conferencing and written procedures uh, governing member and public attendance. Um, apologies, just one moment. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to open uh, the uh, public hearing uh, on that issue. It is approximately 1.10 p.m. on June 2nd, 2022. This is a public hearing conducted by the New York State Hearing and Advisory Board pursuant in part to Section 103A of the Public Officers Law for the purposes of receiving comment on the proposed adoption by the Board of a resolution uh, authorizing the use of video conferencing and to establishing written procedures governing member and public attendance for meetings of uh, this board and meetings of any and all committees or subcommittees now existing or here and after. As designated appointed chairperson on behalf of the Secretary of State, I will serve as the officer for today's public hearing. Section 103A of the Public Officers Law authorizes a public body to allow its members to participate in a meeting remotely under extraordinary circumstances at locations that do not allow for in-person physical attendance by the public, provided that such public body adopts a resolution authorizing such remote attendance and establishes written procedures governing member and public attendance consistent with Section 103A of the Public Officers Law. If adopted, the proposed resolution would authorize uh, this board, any and all of its committees or subcommittees now existing or here and after to use video conferencing to conduct meetings in a manner contemplated by Section 103A of the Public Officers Law, i.e. those meetings where members are unable to physically be present at any such meeting due to an extraordinary circumstance, provided that the public is uh, able to attend and participate in meetings by video conferencing from a remote location that is not open to the public and to establish written procedures governing member and public attendance for such meeting. The proposed resolution would also confirm that the board continues to authorize uh, the members and any and of all of its committee subcommittees now existing or here and after to use video conferencing to conduct meetings where each member wishing to attend and such meeting is physically present at a such meeting at a location where the public can attend. A uh, notice of this public hearing was posted on the department's website along with the proposed resolution and written procedures. Um, all persons wishing to present comments today, um, please uh, indicate by putting something in the chat um, or signaling uh, using the uh, raising hand function on the WebEx. Uh, if you are appearing at uh, our New York City office, um, please um, inform member or staff uh, that you would like to make a public comment. So I'm just going to look around uh, the WebEx just to see if any persons are raising their hand. Okay, I see Jerry is raising his hand. Thank you. Um, I don't recall having received uh, this particular resolution by mail. Is that correct? It would have been emailed as part of the materials for today's package, as well as posted on the department's website. Oh, it was. Yeah. I'm sorry if I missed it then. Could you give us a brief uh, layman's short summary? of the intent of this bill or this provision and along with that sure so um actually the next item or um item uh four on the action items would have been an opportunity to to go over that um and so i i could do that at that point if you'd like um that right now 
Um, basically what we wanna do is see if any members of the public wanna provide public comment before the board discusses the resolution. Does that make sense? Yes, you're asking just about public comment, not board member comment. Correct, yes. I'll defer. <laughs> Um, so is, any person not a member of the board that would like to provide public comment, um, just looking around again on the WebEx, and it doesn't appear as if any individuals at the public location in New York City uh, would like to speak. Um, noting for the record uh, that this meeting is also being uh, recorded and will later be posted on the department's website. Uh, again, having provided opportunity for members of the public to provide comment, there appears to be no public members wishing to offer public comment at this time. Um, as the hearing officer for uh, this meeting, I'm going to close the record. It is approximately 1.15 p.m. No one has appeared to comment to provide um, statements regarding the proposed resolution written procedures. And I therefore declare that this hearing is now closed. The next item on the agenda um, is number three, the department and subcommittee report. I'll turn it over to Jack Bolello with the enforcement report. Jack. Uh, Jack, you're on mute, hold on. Jack. Can you hear me? Yep. I'm good now? Yes. Okay, thanks. Uh, so I'm here, I'm, again, I'm Jack Bellello. Um, I'm here to give um, the enforcement report for the period of March 22 to May 22. Uh, there's been one change since I drafted this report and I'll go over that in a moment. Um, so as indicated in the report, uh, the Total number of consumer complaints that uh, the department received since the last board meeting is zero. The total number of complaints closed since the last board meeting is now two. The total number of pending investigations with the department is three. And the three complaints that we're investigating involve um, the following allegations. Uh, there's one complaint in which uh, is an allegation that a dispenser uh, demonstrated incompetency and failed to issue a refund to a consumer. The second investigation that's still active is uh, uh, involves an allegation that a dispenser is offering online hearing aids. And the third active complaint concerns uh, an allegation that a dispenser uh, has engaged in misleading advertising uh, by way of print media uh, relative to the scope of hearing aid dispensing practices. So those are the three active complaints that the, uh, the Department of State is still uh, looking into. And the last category is uh, during the last 12 months, um, we've only received consumer complaints uh, regarding one hearing aid business and in, during that same 12 month time frame, we haven't received any complaints about uh, specific hearing aid dispensers or audiologists. So that is the report. And I thank you. Any questions yeah. regarding that? Thank you. As Jack asked, uh, does any of the board members uh, have questions or comments for Jack? Okay, doesn't appear as if there's any comment or questions. Uh, so moving on. Dave? Uh, oh, hi, Eric. Just a small side question regarding this. Um, obviously, we're not getting complaints. Uh, I guess most of us are all doing pretty well. Um, I've had some patients come to me recently where they've been to other providers. So it's not a, a tattle in any way, but it doesn't seem like our providers are handing out the New York State form regarding purchasing consumer guide. Mm -hmm. Can we get something back out there for our providers through the state to make sure that's being followed up with? Um, I can certainly uh, discuss that with Jody and have an update at the next meeting regarding 
um, you know, more outreach to our licensees to remind them of their obligations. Um, a lot of people, providers I've spoken to, they didn't realize it's a regulation that they need to adhere to. They feel it's like a kind of an if. Right. We're given an audio ground, so. Mm -hmm. uh, unlike some of our other licensing disciplines, not all of them, all of the licensees provide like an email. So for other disciplines, we're able to provide sort of like email blast notifications and alerts. Um, it's my understanding that this is one of the disciplines um, that that isn't a requirement and the system isn't set up that way. So the only way to really communicate with them is sort of, uh, you know, through regular mail. Um, and I recall at one point licensing was attempting to provide notices um, on like renewals um, so that they had that paperwork. But I will certainly go back and, um, you know, talk to uh jody to see if there's another way to remind them um it looks like ann has a question and brant so i'm just unmuting you both ann um yeah i just wanted to point out that this is something that could be stressed um in the new york state law mandated course that all dispensers have to take is that yeah. the um brochure it's part of the law that that brochure needs to be provided to the patient um at the time i believe it's at the order um, yeah, so what I could do is, like I said, I'll follow up with Jody on alerts and then seeing if there, maybe there's a way to sort of communicate with the schools. And David? I guess my next question, David, would be on well, those uh, lines you like, commented. Um, uh, sorry, we like arrange? Brent, sorry, it looks like Brant wanted to say something. Oh, I'm sorry. Brant? Yes, thank you. And uh, so I apologize, you know, I'm relatively new to uh, this to this group, um, but I'm trying to understand uh, the scope of the jurisdiction that the Department of State has with respect to, um, you know, complaints uh, regarding hearing aids. Um, is there, does the Department of State have any, uh, any uh, jurisdiction over um, like out of state hearing aid companies, you know, those that might market through the internet, or is it really just solely, you know, New York uh, brick and mortar, you know, sorts of institutions? Um, so our jurisdiction is really limited to businesses that obtain a license to lawfully engage in the business. Um, if an out of state business is conducting business illegally, um, you know, it, it's our understanding that potentially that might fall under the attorney general's office, you know, to enjoin persistent illegality under 60, section 63 of the executive law. Um, under the general business law, businesses aren't allowed to actually do direct you know, mailing of hearing aid devices. Um, you know, there's a question to some degree about how that may change with the federal regulations that are not yet to be in effect regarding over the counter hearing aid devices and what devices might fall under that final bucket because there is part of the federal statute, a specific uh, preemption issue that prohibits the states from preventing sort of the sale of those particular devices. Um, so as it stands currently, um, you know, we only would have jurisdiction over those businesses that are licensed. A business that is conducting business sort of illegally um, wouldn't fall under our jurisdiction, but, you know, an out-of-state business could set up a, a sh of like a foreign corporation, for example, could set up a shop in New York obtain a license and dispense hearing aids through that process um, consistent with the general business law. Uh, yep. And just, and just to follow up, sorry. Um, so if you got a complaint from, you know, uh, an entity about an entity that is not licensed to do business in New York, would mm -hmm. that be still counted as a complaint or is this, or does that not register because it's not, you know, an entity that, uh, the state has you know, jurisdiction over. So I, I believe, and perhaps somebody from enforcement could confirm, but I believe we count it for the purposes of having received it, um, but then we close it for lack of jurisdiction um, because they are unlicensed. And, and offline you know, or through separate communication, I'd like to just reach out to you, David, and you can put me in touch with someone I have an inquiry that I'd like to make about a particular out-of-state company just to see 
with you receiving you know, complaints about them. Sure. Um, why don't we schedule a time offline? Yep. And um, be more than happy to help, and we'll get our enforcement team as well there as well. I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Sure. Very um, good. Yep. Jerry. Going, going back to the previous comment, your previous comment, uh, based on Eric's inquiry, um, I think the question that you might want to ask is a broader one than the one you mentioned. Um, I think the question really more appropriately should be what is the um, State Department Division of Licensing doing to wise audiologists of their obligations under state law uh, of which the dispensing of those brochures is one, um, the providing of information about assistive listening devices and specifically telecoils is another. Uh, I believe a couple of years ago, when we modified the literature online and the book, <laughs> uh, we, we added information about that. And I think that I'd like to ask if at the next meeting, somebody would come back and tell us what is being done proactively to advise audiologists of their responsibilities to avoid uh, complaints to avoid violations you know i i think that um that's a good suggestion and i will speak to program staff to see if we could have that information for you at the next meeting jerry uh and eric i just want to clarify um um jerry you keep saying audiologists do you mean hearing aid dispensers in new york state oh thank you uh, hearing care providers is the preferred term. Thank you. That encompasses everyone. Thank you, Ann. Um, Eric, Eric had his hand up, I think. David, just to go back then, is there any way to bring up to the powers that be about developing a email list for the Department of State to send out notices or things such as what we're doing so that our registered dispensers audiologists, hearing instrument specialists, and so forth, get all the information so that they are in tune with what's happening? I mean, certainly, it, like I said, we I'll approach that with, um, you know, the programs and the operation side. The, the issue in part is that, um, you know, some dispensers have been practicing for some quite time, and so they may not have ever pr provided that information to us on like an application. Um, I don't, not, not sure that uh, we capture that. And so the last thing that we would potentially want to do, do is like slow down applications or deny applications because people aren't giving us, you know, an email address so that we can contact them. Um, so there's always, I think, going to be a potential, you know, segment of the licensed population um, that we just don't have email addresses for. Um, but but as I said, you know, uh, these are good points. And uh, after the meeting, I'll be able to raise them with uh, Jody and then the program staff, and we'll be able to uh, come back and, um, you know, provide an update to the board at the next meeting. Uh, hey, then, David, uh, yep. Just to follow up, um, it occurs to me that one piece of mail, you said mail is currently the preferred method of reaching the audiology and dispensing communities. One simple form with a response uh, section uh, and a reply envelope could yield information on the extent to which they're familiar with the law and the extent to which they comply by informing their customers about assistive listening and telecoils, uh, and it could mention the website citation where they can see the law and what it says, and that could also remind people of the sign that we updated that all of their offices need to have posted. And these are very basic best practices mm -hmm. items, uh, and you know I think once a year that kind of thing could be done in such a way that failure to respond 
would risk their license. And I think you'd get a healthy response from that. Um, let, let me chime in. Uh, I think Ann was right on the money when she indicated that uh, because we are all obligated to take uh, CEU uh, course um, on federal law and state law, and that the content of that class has to be approved by the Department of State, then if that particular uh, uh, relationship, um, or if, 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 if it's not in the course content, then the, the course wouldn't be approved. So what we need to do is perhaps uh, look at who's delivering the courses, and if in reality they are telling everybody, you know, you have to be aware of the state law. And that state law, you know, spelled out. I understand, Peter, what you're suggesting. Are you saying that the courses that are now required for licensure is sufficient to have everybody compliance? Because our our understanding is that in the general population of people with hearing aids, there are many, many, many people who never receive any information from their dispensers. Well, I do believe that all we can do is tell the dispenser this is what you are supposed to be doing. Uh, whether you want to go to every office and see if that is indeed what they are uh, providing, that's going to be a tall task. I didn't say that. I said send out one mail and require everyone to state that they are in compliance and they understand. Well, uh, <laughs> I know you're opposed to regulation, but I'm trying to look out for no, 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 I'm not opposed to anything, okay? But all I know is that you shouldn't have to be t told more than once, especially if you are a responsible dispenser, that this is something you need to do and you should do it. That's all. Uh, you all to everyone's ears. Um, it looks like um, Marie has her hand up. Is yeah, I do. Um, I actually teach the the infection control regulations course for the Long Island Speech and Hearing Association. We're having having the meeting next week. The content is in there. They are told what they're supposed to do. But again, it's and I'm going to have to agree with what's been said. You can lead the horse, but you can't force them. They know the information, but if they're not going to apply it that's on them there is a bit of an honor system involved but i don't think it's not that we're giving them the information i know i've gotten phone calls from people who say well you know this happened or that happened and i always refer them back to the website because the information is all there in black and white um so i don't think it's a case of we're not conveying the information i think some people are just choosing not to apply it uh, and um, <laughs> yeah, you. I just kind of following up on what was just said, um, you know, ev all licensed hearing aid dispensers need to take the coursework every two years. And it is the same information pretty much every two years. So I don't think that the issue is that the um, he licensed hearing aid dispensers in New York aren't aware of the information because they hear it every two years. <laughs> I think it's more of the fact that they just are choosing not to, you know, do everything that they're told that they need to do during the process. Correct, and I just agree with that. that up. I think exactly. if and that's why I thought if there was a way to do an email blast to our registered dispensers, from the state, it just kind of gives a little boost to say, hey, we're aware this isn't happening. Get on board. Yes. Doing and it at conferences. They, we'll, if they, if they we'll have to like sign a piece of said. paper. Yeah. Eric. So, like I said, we'll, we'll present something to the board uh, next week on what, if any, um, 
you know, avenues exist to convey this information again to the industries. Um, but uh, Jerry, you'd like to say something? If the licensing board made everyone stipulate in writing that they understand and comply. So if they, a, if they get a complaint, they can have their license revoked so, or they can be fined. So Jerry, on their original application, they are required to affirm um, that they understand and read the provisions of Article 37A of the general business law, the rules promulgated there under under Title 19 of the NYCRR. So they, they already affirm it. They're already yeah. aware of their obligations. It's, you know, as everyone had said, sort of, it's it's not them not being aware. It's potentially them just being lax in their uh, responsibilities. But again, I, I understand that what everyone is saying, I, I will talk to program, we'll have an update on what is feasible um, and actually possible um, at the next board meeting. Next item Thank on you. the agenda is item 3B, the processing report from Emily. Emily, are you there? Good afternoon. Um, included in the materials you were provided, you will find licensing statistics for May of 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021, and 2022. These reports show the number of hearing aid businesses broken down by county a business list broken down by class code or license type, and a report of hearing aid dispensers or, um, broken down by type and county. Uh, please note that in 2020 and 2021, numbers include only licensees and do not include those licensees whose licenses may have expired, but were covered by Executive <laughs> Order 202.11, which allowed individuals licensed by the Department of State to extend the expiration of their license during the state of emergency. And that concludes the processing report. Thank you, Emily. Uh, does any uh, member of the board have any questions for Emily regarding the processing report? Okay, doesn't appear as if any of the board members do. Uh, thank you so much, Emily. Uh, item 3C, education report, Allison Lacey. Uh, Allison, are you there? I'm here. Great. Um, can you please proceed with the uh, education report? Sure. Good afternoon, everybody. The Bureau of Educational Standards continues to audit hearing aid dispenser renewals. Those renewals which do not indicate approval code numbers or do not appear to include T-coil, infection control, and New York State and federal law in addition to the balance of required hours are not processed and sent to the Bureau for an educational compliance audit. A renewal license will only be granted when satisfactory proof of education is provided. So far in 2022, 64 licensees have been audited and 54 have complied. Two licensees did not comply. Of the eight pending, all are within the time frame to respond. A new regulation went into effect on December 7th, 2021, that allows for hearing aid dispenser educational providers to offer qualifying and continuing education courses in a live distance education delivery method. Live distance education means providing instruction in real time where the approved instructor and the students are physically separated but the use of remote technology allows each person participating in the educational program to view and communicate with each other in a live and interactive manner that transmits simultaneous live audio and video. Course availability appears to be adequate and has not been an issue raised by licensees. Are there any questions? Uh, thank you, Allison. Uh, doesn't appear as if any of the board members have questions. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, item 3D on the agenda is the examination report by Shannon McGuire. Shannon, are you there? Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. The following statistics cover exams, exams administered from January to April of 2022. The hearing aid dispenser written exam was administered to 17 applicants with a pass rate of 82%. The practical exam was administered to 22 applicants with an overall pass rate of 
This total includes 10 audiologists with a pass rate of 90% and 12 trainees with a pass rate of 100%. Any questions? What was the amount of dispensers again? Um, for the practical exam, we had 10 audiologists uh, with a 90% pass rate and 12 trainees with a pass rate of 100%. Okay, just looking around the WebEx, um, doesn't look as if any board members have questions. So uh, thank you for the report, Shannon. Thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda, item four, is the assessment of public comments consideration a motion to adopt the resolution and written procedures. Um, Jerry, this is in relation to the public hearing and your question earlier on. Um, so, as everybody knows, uh, we are appearing virtually um, using video, uh, video conferencing technology in part because of the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, the governor's emergency order or executive order relating to the same. Uh, earlier this year, um, Chapter 56 of the Laws of 22 was signed by the governor which authorizes public bodies such as this board um, to adopt a resolution and written procedures that would allow um, one or more of its board members to potentially appear using video conferencing technology in the future under what the law defines or calls as an extraordinary circumstance. Um, so this is an optional um, provision for the board, the board does not have to ad adopt a, a proposal like this. Um, there's th the current executive order that we're operating under is valid through um, June 14th, I believe. Um, and part WW goes into effect, I believe June 18th, or I may have had my dates reversed. Um, but what will happen is if the current state of emergency and the executive order is not continued, after that June date, um, all public bodies are going to have to meet again in person. Um, video conferencing technology, telephone conference technology it won't be permitted unless the state of emergency continues. So what Part WW authorizes is that after the state of emergency ends and bodies, public bodies have to meet in person where the public is able to attend in person, Part WW allows boards to adopt a resolution that would authorize some of its members to appear using video conferencing where the public won't be. Um, so looking around the room, you know, I can guess the, a lot of us are, you know, remotely at home. That home address isn't public. Um, members of the public aren't sitting next to us, at, you know, in our home offices. Um, so if the board chooses to adopt a resolution, it, 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 this would sort of be the opportunity um, and also the written procedures that explain the specific process. Um, part of the specific process, for example, uh, still requires that the majority for the quorum be in the public location. So, you know, not everyone is going to be able to you know, claim an extraordinary circumstance, the, the quorum, the majority quorum still has to appear at a public location that the public can attend. But if after the state of emergency expires and one of the board members has an extraordinary circumstance and can't be at that public location, but still wants to participate, a resolution such as this would potentially allow that um, member to appear virtually and still actively participate and, and even vote on measures. So uh, part in order to, to adopt the resolution, part WW requires a, a public hearing um, that is noticed to the public so that the public could provide comment. Um, that's the second item that we already had on the agenda. Um, no public members participated or offered comment and it's up to the voting members of the board to determine whether or not they would like to adopt a resolution um, and written procedures. And so that's sort of um, the purpose of this agenda item. 
uh, it would has to be done sort of in two parts if that's what the board would like to do. So first, somebody would have to make a motion uh, to adopt a resolution to authorize, you know, video conferencing pursuant to part WW. And then the second part or second motion would be to adopt specific written procedures. Again, the resolution, the written procedures were shared with all the board, part of the board package posted online. And such a resolution, it's going to be posted on the Department of State's website. Um, and it would be, a, you know, sort of uh, the, the rule subject to, you know, future board action. Um, it looks like Eric, you had a question. Uh, just when would we adopt these pro this process and procedures? I'm assuming it's going to be at the next meeting. No, now, I mean, if, if the board would like to, so, because we don't know when the next board meeting will be, if the next board meeting is not during a state of emergency, then everyone will have to be here in person. And then I'll, I'll vote yes to adopt this process. <laughs> <laughs> well, so again, just to be clear, um, if there's a resolution and a written procedure, you know, the majority of the board still has to be at, you know, a public location. So usually it's, you know, 123 William Street, a Buffalo office or 99 Washington Avenue, One Commerce Plaza and Albany, which are usually our location. Um, but I know, Jerry, you had a question earlier on. So I, I just want to make sure I, I was responsive to, to Jerry's question. So, Jerry, do you have any more questions? Thank you, David. Um, part of my frustration at the moment is uh, the quality of the closed captionings that are appearing. Uh, do we have a live cap cart provider today or are these auto captions? Um, I believe it's the auto captions. Right. We should have a cart provider here too. Um, they were going to stream. Um, I sent out the streaming link to all the board members with the meeting invitation, and it's also posted on the public notice, I believe. Uh, is it possible for your, you to put that in the chat if you have it, Denise? Maybe that's something Jerry could just click on and maybe see if... Do you just say that it's auto captioning regardless of how we choose to receive it? Um, do you want the WebEx to have the auto captioning? We, you can remove that, I believe, yourself from your computer. Like, I can put mine up and down. Um, as far as the cart service provider that we've secured, they provide us with, with the streaming link that was sent out with the invitation, the meeting <laughs> invitation. If you have that, you should have that link to uh, access your streaming my, link. Denise, my experience of many years, as long as we've had Zoom uh, primarily, is that when we meet via Zoom and we have a cart provider, the cart provider's captions are streamed into Zoom on the same screen. Um, if I heard you correctly, you said the only way I could access the card provider's captions would be via a supplemental screen, in which case I can't look at people and read the captions at the same time as I'm doing or attempting to do right now with the auto captions. Um, the auto captions are slow and the auto captions are inaccurate and I can only read two or three lines at a time. So if I miss something, by the time I try to go back and see what it in fact said, it's gone. Um, so, you know, I think that uh, I've complained before about WebEx. I think that uh, from a technical standpoint, uh, the Department of State should look at trying to do something about this, at the very least, seeing if you can't get your cart provider, who I assume is doing a good job uh, to feed their captions into the WebEx uh, stream. And David, I think we tried to do that with the demonstration, um, and it, it was difficult, but I do know that we have had an upgrade to our WebEx. 
So maybe there have been some improvements on that front and I can check that out for you and get back to you, Jerry. Yeah, I don't know anyone else who is dependent on captions at the moment. Um, but if there are other people, I would think they would have a similar problem to mine. So, Jerry, if I could just offer a suggestion, have you tried changing the setting on the WebEx? So instead of grid, it's stacked so that when the person is speaking, they're highlighted and then just have the cart page open side by side. That way you could see everything. Um, you know, I, I'm doing that right now and it seems- Are you asking me if I could split my screen between WebEx and stream text? So I got both on the same screen? Yes. And then uh, if I you ch change the- have, I don't have the skill set to split the screen on my laptop, unfortunately, I'm sorry. Um, and I didn't have the time this morning uh, to set up the stream text on my iPad and try to put it well, next to my computer, but I don't want to take up any more time on, on this. That's okay. I'll get in touch with you, Jerry. I'll, I'll ask about the um, new version of the WebEx and if there's been any improve, improvements um, where they could provide the captioning right into uh, onto our screen here. And I'll, I'll get back to you on that. Yes. Denise, it's, it's captioning quite well um, on my computer screen. Mine too. So, Jerry, if you have any questions, please feel free to call me. I can tell you, I mean, we can work on that. You know, I, a lot of people, the skill set, as you said, can be difficult sometimes. So, we need to make sure it's more accessible. Thank you. David, I had just one simple question about um, uh, the resolution. I assume that all of the requirements for accessibility continue to apply uh, under these new rules and regulations. Um, I don't understand the question. What, what well, do you mean? If we need, if we need access to effective communication for our hearing disability, does that continue to be a requirement under these new provisions? So the Part WW doesn't change, you know, anything with respect to um, like accessibility. It, after, uh, unless the governor extends the state of emergency, once that ends, our board meetings are going to go back to in person at, you know, those general three offices, 123 William. And so, Everything that we were doing sort of pre pandemic in terms of accessibility will, will continue to be there. The law doesn't change any of that. What the law does is it just say, for example, let's say, you know, 1 of the board members had, you know. Uh, on the way to the office, some sort of like car accident or, or something and. For whatever, you know, and wanted to participate at a board meeting. Um, that board member would be able to participate at his or her, you know, office or in the hospital bed or wherever they were um, using ostensibly the WebEx features that we are using now. Right. Thank you. So, um, hopefully I've answered uh, the board's yeah. questions. It does. Any member of the board like to make a motion to adopt the draft resolution? I'll yes. make a motion. I'll second the motion. Okay. Are uh, any other board members in favor? Okay. Um, for the record, do any voting board members oppose the resolution to adopt the resolution? Adopt the motion to adopt the resolution. Sorry. Okay, doesn't appear as if any of the board members are in opposition. Um, having passed a um, motion to adopt a resolution, is there a motion by any of the voting board members to adopt the draft written procedures on how to use video conferencing technology pursuant to part WW? To adopt the process. Okay, um, motion being made by Eric Freeman. Is there a second? I'll second it. Okay. Okay. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 
Aye. Aye. Okay. Um, anyone oppose? It doesn't appear as if there's any opposition. Um, so uh, meeting minutes should reflect that unanimous vote of the voting members uh, voted in favor to adopt a resolution to authorize video conferencing pursuant to Part WW. A second motion to adopt written procedures pursuant to Part WW. Um, so, it, of course, in the event that the state of emergency is continued by another executive order, um, we will certainly communicate that to the board um, in advance of the next board meeting so that we're all aware of sort of if we have to be there in person or not. Um, and so we'll definitely uh, be in touch with the board members. The next item on the agenda is discussion on a legislative proposal. Um, this topic came up briefly at our last board meeting. Um, just for background, a, a few days prior to the board meeting, Dr. Kim um, had requested an opportunity to have um, two presenters or speakers uh, speak to the board about um, a certain legislative proposal. At the last board meeting, uh, Jerry had also uh, raised a concern regarding the board uh, to the board regarding that legislative proposal. I had advised then um, that given sort of the short period of time from when Dr. Kim um, had asked to, to speak on the issue as, as well as Jerry, um, we were going to table it until today's meeting where I was going to provide more background to the board. Um, so we do have the two speakers um, that Dr. Kim had referenced to the board. I believe they're here. Um, but before we do that, I would just want to um, advise the board or provide that background information to the board on the uh, pending proposals um, for board discussion. Uh, please note that uh, the Department of State doesn't have a position on these pending legislative proposals at this time. Uh, it is a standard policy of the department not to comment or offer opinion on legislation until it's passed both houses and presented to the governor uh, for possible signing or veto. So nothing um, that I'm about to say should be construed as the department expressing an opinion on the uh, proposal. Uh, that said, there is a current proposal um, to amend Section 802 of the New York State General Business Law. Uh, that section, as it currently exists, states in part, no otolaryngologist or other licensed physician who has conducted a medical evaluation of hearing loss shall engage in the business of dispensing hearing aids for a profit. Um, Article 37 of the General Business Law, where that section is located, uh, which also grants the department jurisdiction over um, hearing aid dispensers does not define the term for a profit. The current version of that law has not been substantially amended since it was first enacted back in 1998. The 19, uh, the prior version of the 1998 law um, stated substantially the, the same text, um, but what it did say was no otolaryngologist or other licensed physician who has conducted an examination and issued a written recommendation pursuant to subdivision one of section 784 of the article shall engage in the business of fitting, renting, selling hearing aids for a profit, provided, however, that such not-for-profit renting, um, fitting, or selling shall only include the cost of the hearing aid plus such other reasonable and necessary costs and expenses to be established by rule and regulation promulgated by the secretary. Um, so the 1998 amendment obviously repealed that um, discretionary power of the department uh, to promulgate regulations to define um, other necessary and reasonable costs beyond the cost of the hearing aid, which is what the original statute provided for uh, prior to uh, 1999. In 2001, um, when the 1998 law was going into effect, um, the department had issued in a 
a response to an inquiry um, that noted that because the department no longer had the power to issue regulations to define it, um, that the for-profit should be limited to actually the cost of the hearing aid, which is what the old law had said, um, but noted that a 5% increase above that cost would likely fall within sort of a safe harbor provision. Since 2001, the department has adhered to the original uh, interpretation um, that is still the current law in effect. Um, but the uh, current uh, legislative proposal, uh, which as noted at the last board meeting on March 21st, uh, relating to Senate Bill S-3380, um, would amend Section 802 of the General Business Law uh, to delete that first sentence. Um, and so in effect, it would delete the sentence that says no otolaryngologist or other licensed physician who has conducted a medical evaluation of hearing loss shall engage in the business of dispensing hearing aids for profit. So if the proposal um, were to advance, that sentence that I just read would no longer be part of the general business law. Um, and therefore, there wouldn't be a restriction on licensed physicians um, to engage in the dispensing of hearing aids for a profit. As noted also um, at the last board meeting, um, this bill is similar to prior bills that had been offered in uh, multiple legislative sessions, specifically the 09 to 10 under S5257, the 11 12 session under S3788. 1314 session under S3354, 1516 session under S2024, 1718 session under S3488, and the uh, 1920 session under S2565. Uh, it should also be noted that there is a, another um, bill also pending, um, which would establish a pilot program um, to allow uh, for-profit sales solely within the county of Westchester. Um, that bill is S5597. Um, again, I'm just noting this um, to the board. The Department of State doesn't take a position on any of the bills. This is just being provided for informational purposes, in part because Dr. Kim had requested an opportunity um, as well as Jerry to discuss this at our last board meeting. Um, and with that, I guess we can open it up to the board for discussion. Um, and then um, we can go to Dr. Kim's invited guests. Uh, so it looks like Anne, you have your hand up. Um, yes. Yeah, so the first comment that I'd like to make is that um, if they are to remove that language, um, that they cannot um, dispense for whether it be profit or nonprofit. Um, can we assume that means that they would have to apply for and become registered hearing aid dispensers? Um, because as I see it, as a as a licensed audiologist who with a doctoral level degree. I still have to register mm -hmm. to be uh, uh, and show that I had the appropriate coursework um, and, and take the practical examination to dispense hearing aids, either for profit or non for profit in the state of New York. So my question is, removing that line, um, <clears throat> I would assume if a ENT um, would like to dispense hearing aids in New York State, they would have to become New York State fully licensed registered hearing aid dispensers to do so. Correct? Um, <laughs> so the, the bill, the proposed legislation doesn't change um, any other provisions under section uh, I'm sorry, under Article 37A of the general business law, the proposal um, only strikes that one sentence. Um, so section or paragraph two of the same section 802 states every licensed physician 
who engages in dispensing of hearing aids in compliance with the provisions of the section shall be required to comply with other sections of the article. Um, so, you know, unless there's something more clear, I wouldn't expect that um, your assumption is correct, that they would be a business um, and then therefore would have to operate as a business in kind um, like everybody else. But th it's unclear um, in the uh, legislature. And so I think we would have to wait to see if there's any more information about the bill. Um, yeah, I just, it, so, sorry, David, my, my understanding, <clears throat> um, and this is the information that I give when anybody calls me with questions, is that in New York State, um, nobody is allowed to touch a hearing aid or work with a hearing aid unless they are uh, trainee or licensed under the New York State um, to uh, dispense hearing aids. So I think really that gets to the bottom of it, right? Like if I understand whether that, that um, Scent is, is removed or not isn't really the issue. The issue is are if they're going to be licensed to do so. Because, right, for consumer protection, as a consumer protection board, we want to make sure we're protecting the consumer. And we would only want hearing aids to be dispensed by somebody who not only is licensed to dispense in New York State and also receives that continuing education. If not, then we have a consumer protection issue because we would have somebody who is allowed to dispense hearing aids without any uh, following any of you know the requirements under the general business law. Well, oh, sorry, uh, Eric, you want to say something? Um, I'm in full agreement with Ann. Uh, my understanding that this was being put in place in order for a uh, particular group, I don't need to get into that part, and that's irrelevant. The idea of the concept, though, is to enhance and further facilitate ease of access for hearing health care to be provided. And the thought was with an ENT or physician per se that they'll just be able to hire an audiologist, dispenser, or if it's under a licensing plan of a doctor's office to do whatever they're trained as a trainee or whatever. Um, my concern is as a hearing health care professional, just as Ann stated, our ENTs are booking out months and months just to see a person for earwax removal. How are they going to spend half an hour to an hour dispensing, correcting, counseling on care? Okay, so it does not improve access. It, it improves a cash flow for a segment of physicians or so forth. And I'm all good for my for for ENTs to provide. I want them to if they're the ones doing it or if they have registered dispensers as a part of that program to that. There is a uh, dispense, uh, excuse me, an audiologist in my region that they are not dispensing, but she is clinical for the ENT. I'm good with that too. We need more providers, but we need registered dispensers that take care of the patients, audiology, IHIS, and, and have it go in that proper path. And how can we get that information besides talking directly to our legislative bodies that are making decisions without the input of this board? Uh, it looks like I, I saw Marie, you had your hand up next. Yeah, I um, kind of wanted to to piggyback onto what Ann was saying and now what Eric has just said, in that um, if the ENT is subject to the same rules and regulations as the rest of us um, and they're providing that care, that's fine, but it does become a consumer protection issue. And it also, from an audiologic standpoint, from an audiology standpoint, as a doctor of audiology, is... Um, a, a medical professional, a, a physician, then using my profession um, as an audiologist as a, a subcategory for, a, I'm sorry, and I'm going to call it what it is, a cash flow to their office. 
Yes. I mean, I've heard ENT say it. Um, we need streams of revenue. Um, I went into audiology to provide hearing health care. Um, if I wanted to be rich, I probably would have found something else to do. Um, I think the state needs to look at it from a consumer standpoint. It's uh -huh. What does the ENT provide? I'm sorry, I don't mean to be very entertaining, but it's the truth. Um, what is that ENT going to provide that the licensed certified ASHA audiologist, doctor of audiology, or hearing aid dispenser who's dispensing according to the rules of the state going to provide that's going to allow this patient so much of an improvement? Thank you. Um, and next, uh, Jerry, looks like you had your hand up. Thank you. Um, first, let me say, I have not explored this at all since the last meeting, uh, but when the legislation proposed first came to my attention, uh, I consulted with others through the Hearing Loss Association leadership and its professional advisors. And the best way to put it is that we believe that this bill if passed is a slippery slope and there's very little to be gained and a good deal to be concerned about as the previous speakers have addressed. Uh, David, um, do you have any information about whether this bill has gone anywhere? Because I believe it's simply an attempt by the state medical board to try to give doctors another source of income and it's been done for several years and it's never gone anywhere. So I think we should not pay it any attention unless it's a threat to take seriously. So, um, you know, the, the current bill, uh, Senate bill S3380, um, you know, to my knowledge, hasn't gone anywhere. Um, and actually I believe today is the last day of the legislative session um, so I'm not sure that it's likely to go anywhere. Uh, to my knowledge, it, it never even went to um, committee. Um, so, you know, I, I can't say with certainty that, you know, it, it won't get picked up or won't progress, but I suspect likely that in this legislative session, considering today's the last day, it's not <laughs> likely to, to go anywhere. Um, I saw uh, Peter had your hand up. <clears throat> yes. Uh, I've been tackling this particular dilemma for probably more than 20 years, uh, participating in discussions up in uh, Senator Little's or Littell's office in Albany. Uh, one of the, the hopes of our organization or this particular group should be that we are, are able to provide uh, the consumer with the opportunity to know that they are going to get an objective opinion uh, related to the need for amplification and not based upon the opportunity to profit. And so, uh, if you have a person who you um, would like to um, have examined by a physician because you have some questions or there are one of the eight red flags, uh, you have to then begin to wonder, is the doctor going to say, oh, you definitely need hearing aids. You can get them right here as prior to the adoption of uh, uh, allowing physicians to dispense, he may have said, you know, I think you can wait a year or two. It isn't that bad. Oh, and God. so uh, it, it really eliminates the opportunity for a professional who you would hope would act in a professional manner to deliver an objective opinion. Also, if we are indeed required to have the, um, the sign on the wall that says 
that uh, the New York State and the Food and Drug Administration regu uh, recommend that you see an ENT prior to purchasing a hearing aid, uh, will they eliminate that particular requirement? Uh, because it seems like all we're doing is uh, providing uh, business opportunities to physicians. So uh, see, it's a situation where we need to be able to sit down with the legislators and explain to them the, the minute details of what changing the law uh, means. Thank you, Peter. Uh, looks like Jason, you had your hand up. Uh, yes, thank you, David. Um, just, I'm from the, I'm with the uh, the executive secretary for the state board for audiology over here at the education department. Uh, for those of you who are not Albany creatures, like like a few of us here are, uh, there are lots of bills out there. There are lots of bad bills out there. Uh, this bill has been around, it looks like, since at least 2009. Um, I, I would not, I, I don't think it, it merits getting too upset about this bill. This is a bill that uh, the education department has continually opposed on the fact that it, we, we view this as an infringement on a protected scope of practice. Um, so, you know, I, we, we could have a lot of fun and find lots of crazy bills to argue about. Um, this is just one of those that possibly, you know, in my experience when I was still over in the legislature, um, you know, very often you will get somebody introduces a bill to make one of their constituents happy and they just put the bill in. Um, so I, I would caution against uh, taking this too seriously. Mm -hmm. uh, it looks like Sharon, you had your hand up. Yes. Um, in, um, Listening to all the, this information um, about there being, you know, lots of bills out there, um, I'm confused as to um, how are, for example, pilot programs allowed to um, even be developed if there are rules about dispensing um, and there are bills proposed, but for example, in Westchester, um, if there are pilot programs, how they're even allowed to exist. I'm, I'm very confused. How does that happen? So there, there are basically um, two bills um, that were proposed during this current cycle. Um, the first bill would change uh, Section 802 to just delete that one sentence that I had read that said no laryngologist or other licensed physician who's conducted a medical evaluation of hearing loss shall engage in the business of dispensing hearing aids for profit. So, th so that's one proposal that was offered by a legislature. Uh, the, the second proposal is entirely different, and that one would actually establish um, a, a new law that would create all of the requirements to establish a specific pilot program solely within Westchester County. Um, I believe the current proposal would be for five years. And then after five years, it would be up to the legislature to decide if they would, you know, continue the law um, by either, you know, passing a new law that would extend the time or, you know, decide that this pilot program has proved to be of value and, you know, potentially offered it across the state. Um, so the answer to your question is like, how is that done? Currently, it can't be done. Um, it requires an act of the legislature to pass both bills in the Senate and the Assembly and then give it to the governor and then the governor has to sign it. So these are just proposals um, that were partially discussed at the last meeting. Um, and so, you know, the, the purpose of uh, putting it on the agenda today was just, you know, it seemed as if the board wanted to have an opportunity to have uh, an open and fair discussion about it. Um, well, then, as of today, the physician's offices or ENT's offices, they're supposed to be operating according to today's New York state law, not Correct. any pilot program. Correct. Yes. <clears throat> um, it looks like, Eric, you have your hand up. Um, yeah, on a small note. 
I know, for example, at a local hospital in my area, they have an ENT department and an audiology department and the audiology department. I love them there and they're doing a fantastic job, but they dispense and it's separate. And I'm, that's great. Bringing them together could be where those conflicts of interest are, I, I believe, for um, audiologists and hearing specialists. A small point. Um, for example, the OTC bill that came up that got pushed, the Bose bill, if anybody hasn't heard, Bose is now pulled out of saying they're going to do hearing aids. They were the number one push. Okay, they decided that somewhere along the lines, you need a hearing health care professional to take care of the patient. I think, as Jerry said, and we've all been discussing, it's a slippery slope. And so when all these information, these bills get popped up, as an advisory board, I understand our guidelines and what we can do. But I'm asking, how can we have more teeth to take our advice as a consumer advocacy board to the Department of State, the powers that be, to get it to our legislators, to get it to our governor. So when these things pop up, they ask the questions so they're better educated. I want hearing aids for everybody that needs help. Okay? Whether I give away free hearing aids or whether Medicare picks up more, reimburses better, whatever it is, we need to do more. But slippery slopes never help our consumers. Oh, sorry. Um, it looks like Sharon, you have your. I'm sorry, um, Anna, Dr. Kim. Uh, looks like you have your uh, hand up. Yeah, certainly this has triggered a lot of healthy uh, conversation. I think this is the most heated debate we've had in, in the last couple of years. Um, <laughs> So, you know, I, I agree uh, with all the previous speakers. Certainly, um, if you're going to get into the hearing aid business, you got to be licensed. So, I mean, for me, that's a no brainer. Um, but I also, I kind of disagree with the fact that hearing aid uh, dispensers should be separate from Odo. Certainly at Columbia, our audiologists, our hearing aid dispenser, we work in tandem. And you know, when, when, they're, when they see something abnormal, they come, Come by. They asked us to take a look. It's it's a kind of a mutual um, teamwork in a way. I don't think it's mutually exclusive. I think having an otolaryngologist and an audiologist work together would provide the best care for our patients. So uh, that aspect, I do disagree. But um, you know, some of the earlier comments. Uh, certainly, uh, we're not making a profit here from from selling hearing aids and. And uh, I, I invited Dr. Chandra Sekar, who is our previous president of our academy, and uh, uh, Dr. Blazer to come in and talk to us about their experience because how they practice is very different from, from you know, my milieu. So, uh, David, I don't know, uh, unless there's more um, board member comments, maybe it would be a good time to have them talk. Sure. Um, so thank you for um, making that sort of introduction. I will go and unmute. Um, hopefully. I just did it, Dave. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, as Dr. Uh, Kim mentioned, um, there are two speakers. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll turn it over um, to you both. Thank you and welcome. And, um, you know, feel free to address the board. Uh, thank you. So, uh, my name is Bob Glazer. I'm the CEO for ENT and Allergy, and thank you for inviting me to this session. Um, so, by way of background, uh, ENT and Allergy is, is uh, a, a large private practice group that employs right now over 125 licensed audiologists and hearing aid dispensers. Um, and we work in tandem. Uh, our, otolaryngologists and audiologists to provide what I think is stellar hearing health care to our patients. We see over 100,000 patients a month across, and we're in, in New York and New Jersey, uh, and, and in New York, we probably have 30 locations, uh, but we are really the, uh, the primary provider right now in the community for, for uh, the hearing impaired and, and the hearing uh, health populations. Our, our um, audiologists are all licensed uh, uh, 
AUDs, and, and they all also get hearing aid dispensing uh, licenses. And I want to say from the outset that our otolaryngologists and our audiologists uh, are, are tasked with providing great care and not doing this for a profit. It's doing it to help patients who have hearing problems and nothing more. I think that the real issue that we're encountering, particularly uh, post-COVID, is finding um, enough licensed professionals, hearing health professionals, uh, in, in the environment right now. There's a whole bunch of people that retired. There's not enough people licensed, and there's a real need for uh, additional hearing health professionals. Um, I'm happy to say that, again, we've had a pretty good track record of recruiting what I think are some of the finest audiologists to our team that work in conjunction with our audiologists. And what we're looking for is really for the state to amend the legislation to allow otolaryngologists in conjunction with licensed audiologists. Everybody you can't sell a hearing aid, I agree with that, without having all the licensing in place. But to do that, because this has become a, a real patient access issue. Um, and I'm going to ask um, Dr. Shantra Shaker, who, by the way, is the past president of the American Academy of Otolaryngology, to talk about her experience. She is, by the way, a fellowship-trained neurotologist uh, on top of being uh, a residency-trained um, otolaryngologist. Dr. Shantra Shaker. Um, good afternoon. Thank you for inviting us and thank you for listening to us. Thank you for allowing us to listen to your very robust discussion. Um, so, you know, uh, the American Academy of Otolaryngology had neck surgery, which represents 13,000 practicing otolaryngologists in the United States, um, of which I was president a couple of years ago. Um, really um, believes and sort of preaches the mantra um, to combine metaphors of the hearing healthcare team. So patients or individuals with hearing loss, with hearing concerns, with tinnitus, with hyperacusis, with misophonia, um, all of these individuals are served best when they are cared for by an otolaryngologist in conjunction with an audiologist or a hearing instrument specialist. Um, and yes, there are these 10 red flags. And um, I heard some of the discussion about uh, why it might be, I guess, bad for otolaryngologists to take care of these patients. I will tell you, we have a lot to offer these patients, as do audiologists, as do hearing instrument providers. Um, we can address the 10 red flags. We all, each of us can provide you with stories about um, maybe um, people who didn't have the right uh, motivation and fit people with hearing aids who just really needed serum and removal or maybe could have benefited from a tympanoplasty or um, safety surgery um, and need to be given that counseling from soup to nuts. And that's something that you know, we can lead in because we are able to discuss the risks and benefits and alternatives of various methods in which to improve your hearing, improve your quality of life. Um, we, uh, I, personally, I routinely have patients who are sent to me by community, not inside my practice, because we do have, as uh, Mr. Glazer said, 125 audiologists in our practice, and it's really a pleasure to work side by side with them. I think they get a lot of challenging cases. You know, Dr. Kim can tell you when you're a neurotologist, every single patient is a masking dilemma. Every single patient has, you know, it's a very difficult audiogram uh, to do, but it's really lovely to be able to work with them in conjunction. But I routinely am sent patients from uh, outside private practice. Uh, audiologists and hearing instrument specialists because they are concerned about perhaps one of these red flags or they have some, things don't quite look right or the patient isn't getting the benefit that they need. And when I can see the patient and address the issue, 
um, I, of course, will send them back to their local person. The best hearing healthcare is the one you can access, right? So, and, and we want to provide top level hearing healthcare that is accessible. It may be true that there are otolaryngologists for whom a cerumen appointment takes a few months, but in our practice, you actually can get in the same day or the next day to see a board certified otolaryngologist and have that problem taken care of. Um, we have about 250 doctors in our uh, uh, physicians in our practice. So, and they, we range a huge geographical range. Um, and I think people as uh, one of the things we learned from COVID is how to use uh, technology better so people can make appointments easier. Um, if people cancel, other people can get in so that nobody's time is wasted. When I see somebody with hearing loss, I'm gonna look for various types of hearing loss. I'm gonna look for genetics. I'm gonna look for family history. I'm gonna look for ameliorating issues that are very important to deal with. Um, and I actually will be able to counsel them about medical management, about surgical management, and about device management. And that device may be air conduction hearing devices. It may be uh, personal sound amplification products, if they're just uh, you know, a mild, early sort of uh, entry level kind of hearing uh, issue. Uh, it may be bone conduction devices, and it may be um, surgically implanted hearing devices that yes, I implant, but of course I rely on my really incredibly trained um, and experienced audiology colleagues to program and to interface with maybe an air conduction device on one side and a implanted device on the other side. So I think the issue is complicated and in my perception, and I've been following this issue for just about as long as it's been around. I've been in practice um, in New York since I finished, in uh, New York and New Jersey since I finished my fellowship, which was back in 1993. Um, so I think the problem is that the law as it's written now actually prevents otolaryngologists from performing our full range of our specialty. We're not gonna individually dispense hearing aids. We're just not gonna do it. We actually have to use our time um, and our skills in a different manner. Counseling, absolutely. But the audiologists we either work with in our offices or in the community, when we have this two-way communication, we'll do the dispensing. So th this is, it's a, it's a measure to allow us to perform the full aspect of otolaryngologic care, of ear, nose, and throat care, of, of helping to restore or improve quality of life. And I wonder if you don't mind if I can ask Mr. Glaser to talk to us a bit about the audiologist who work within our practice. Sure, thank you, uh, Dr. Chandra Shaker. So again, um, we have 125 licensed audiologists, hearing aid dispensers. Uh, they, they take all the tests and, and all the licensing. Um, a typical audiologist has got a, you know, a, a, a schedule where they're seeing anywhere from two to three patients an hour for both clinical and or uh, counseling uh, uh, sessions. Um, we really, uh, you know, the issue is being able to compensate audiologists uh, in a way that uh, encourages them to join the profession. Being a AUD these days, um, four years of bachelor's degree and then four years of post back training, um, you know, you've got to as a result of that, um, you know, uh, be able to compensate people appropriately. And I think that um, we do that. We're an attractive uh, employer. Uh, after all, how do you keep 125 licensed audiologists happy? I have trouble keeping happy uh, another 200 doctors, but we do because I think at the end of the day, we provide a great service to our patients. And that's what this is all about, providing a great service to our patients. And I think it's become uh, even more difficult 
uh, for patient access, and we're trying to solve for that. We're trying to solve for it together. That's that's what I'm trying to get. At, so, thank you. You're muted, David. Thank you, Jerry. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> forgot to hit the unmute button. Um, so thank you for uh, those comments. Um, it looks as if a couple of the board members have their hands up. Uh, so just going in the order in which they're appearing on my screen, um, looks like Anne, uh, you have your hand up. Yeah, I have a question. Um, I'm just a little confused because um, I thought we were previously talking about how currently um, it was not, so audiologists um, sorry, hearing aids are not allowed to be dispensed for profit in an ENT office, but we're hearing from a group that's doing that. So I'm confused how this, um, fits together. Cause I, I thought that that regulation had not yet been, um, put into place that hearing aids were being allowed to be dispensed in an ENT practice in New York state. Am I missing something? Um, you know, I, I can't answer that question. Um, I suspect um, that they're probably like technically like different legal entities that are involved in each of these situations. Um, mm -hmm. I've seen this, you know, from experience previously um, where you know, the, the, the particular situation that I recall seeing years ago would be you would have, you know, the physician's office um, in, you know, an office, um, a medical office sort of suite, and they would go in through one door and that would technically uh, on paper be the, the legal entity of the physician's office. And then they would leave into the vestibule area, enter a different door, which was technically then a separate legal entity which was the business that would be selling the devices. Um, it's, I, I don't wanna call it um, an irregularity with the law, but without knowing the specific business model that was just described, you know, I, it would be inappropriate for me to speculate as to how they're actually engaged in the business model that they're just describing. That would be just my guess. So is it fair for us to ask that question? Is it two separate businesses? I mean, it, I don't, there, there's nothing I, that I'm aware of that prohibits the board from engaging in an open dialogue. I, mean, Denise, I bring my mother to a practice like that, and there's two separate copays. You do go on the one side, you pay the copay, you see the audiologist, you go on the other side, you pay your copay, you see the doctor, but they're kind of the same practice, but they may have two separate names. I'm not quite sure. Yeah, so there's two separate businesses functioning yes. in the same building. Right, yes. they're kind of together, but separate. So <laughs> my, so two, mm -hmm. yeah, please, Anne. No, I just, so is, were we um, hearing from ENT and allergy um, as an example of how two separate businesses can function together or are we hearing from ENT and allergy because they're a group that is an ENT practicing that is hiring audiologists to dispense for profit or nonprofit in their business? Yeah, I don't know if Mr. Glazer, if you want to answer that. So, so I, I will answer it because I, I think that you know, this is an issue that has been around for a long time. We believe we're in compliance with the law as we interpreted it as the, uh, as we interpreted what profit was defined. And that has uh, been what our legal counsel has advised us. And, and we, uh, we certainly do a cost accounting uh, uh, model here that, that, that shows the costs of selling a hearing aid along with the costs of the audiologist, the space, all those people to 
uh, show that we're not making more than this 5% threshold that the state has out there. Now, we go through a lot of machinations to do that. Uh, we're not two separate companies. We are, I'm being totally, you know, out front with you and saying, we're just looking to provide a great service here for our patients. And I think that, you know, in the past, there were other physicians and I'm gonna say other specialties, ophthalmologists, optometrists, all sorts of people that were trying to make a profit on selling hearing aids, not professionals that were really trying to do good for the patients. We're trying to do good for the patients. We're, we wanna maintain and, and have colleagues that are audiologists. I hire more audiologists than anybody but the VA. We are the biggest employer of audiologists uh, other than the VA in the country. And I wanna work together with you as a team to provide great care to, to our patients. And what we're looking for again is for this committee and working with us to advocate that otolaryngologists together with audiologists can do this service. We're not looking to make so, profits here. We're, we're looking to provide a great service to patients. That's all. So, so Dr. Glazer? Uh, no, I'm, a, I'm not a doctor. Oh, sorry. So off. Mr. Glazer? I'm just um, So, So um, audiologists and ENT work together um, clinically um, throughout the state in a lot of variety of settings um, to diagnose hearing loss. Um, so that relationship is very well grounded um, throughout the state. Um, audiology and ENT definitely do work together. Um, audiologists um, often go in as contractors into ENT practices to provide that testing. However, um, the devices are um, fit um, based on, um, you know, within uh, audiology, uh, hearing aid dispensing practice. So that's it's the differentiator. Nobody is arguing that audiology and ENT uh, don't work together because they do. Um, um, for example, our organization, we work with a group of ENTs who uh, provide, you know, we together um, provide cochlear implants, bone anchored hearing aids, all those things. But the dispensing is not done within the ENT practice. Um, and, you know, you, uh, your group of peers, you know, that you guys do a great job. Um, the concern is not every, not, not every ENT Group would. So, I want to pick you back. I know a lot of I know a lot of ENT groups outside of ours who, you know, um, um, don't have the the quality that we do. And, and I'm proud of what we do, and proud of the service that we provide. As I would tell you that all of our audiologists would say the same thing to you. We're not selling a hearing aid to make the profit. We're selling the hearing aid to help the patient. Um, so thank you. It looks like uh, several board members have their hands up as, uh, so I'm just gonna go in order of the hands that appear on my screen. Uh, Eric. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Glazer, uh, Dr. Sujana, I wanna thank you for what you've shared. In my 19 years as a hearing healthcare specialist, and you know, hearing specialist board certified, I'm on the state board, et cetera, et cetera. I'm gonna share a comment my mother taught me. If you care about the ears, the ears will take care of you. So first and foremost, yes, we all have issues in our field where it feels as though it's always about selling a hearing aid. I think we have to get away from the commodity of selling a hearing aid and think of simply improving quality of life through a device as a hearing aid or as a Baja or cochlear implant for those that can provide that. Myself, I'm a provider for Adhere. I'm a big advocate for the Adhere. Um, I have had patients come to me because of issues that there's no one working with them. So I see them for Adhere or other. And when I have patients that come to me that have 
hypercusis or mesophonia, for example. I refer back to my local audiologists that are not part of my group and to the local ENT clinics. I think the collaborative care is huge. I'm glad you're doing that and the ENT associates are doing that. That's what we need to do. My biggest concern is I'll use an example that happened. I went to a physician's group, which is associated with a hospital that has a ENT and audiology clinic. These patients have to travel 45 minutes just to get there. I had a service center, a minute walk from where that was. And they said, nope, we refer all the patients to this group. So I understand the concept of possibly opening up for more care, collaborative care, and ease of transaction. I hate saying transaction from one to the other. But I think we have to keep sight of that patients need a choice. Insurance companies are not given choices. And, and I'm not saying doctors aren't, but when I refer out, I've had people come back to me that say we were referred to the audiology clinic, part of the hospital or a particular instead of refer back to you and they were concerned as to why. I was under the impression that we should be providing a list of providers, audiologists and hearing specialists in our community so that the patient can advocate for themselves where they want to go. I could be wrong, but I think the collaborative concept is wonderful and we need to do a better job. But I don't think we need to change a law. Now, if it is a matter of a business practice, um, as you as you said, sir, to get properly reimbursed, I think that's another issue. Other than stripping the regulations that protect our our patients in in New York or our hearing impaired community in the state of New York, I think there could be a better way to do that. And I hope I'm right on, or I hope I'm conveying myself reasonably with that. And I, you know, I thank you for your time for sharing that because. I have had patients come to my area from your group and they've been wonderful. What they've expressed about your clinic is top notch. They ju you're just not in my area. But I don't think we should be funneling to one group. I think that's something that New York has to be careful of, in my opinion. Thank you, Eric. Um, it looks like the next uh, board member has the hands up according to my screen is Jerry. Jerry, you want to say something? Thank you, David. I want to thank Robert Glazer and uh, the um, uh, doctor, whose name I won't try to pronounce, uh, for being with us today. It's Chandra Shaker, like salt shaker. It's been oh, thank you. It's it's glad it's good that you're here, and and it's been helpful. I want to say I'm a representative of the consumer on this panel. I have late deaf and hearing loss. I currently have two cochlear implants, but six or eight years ago, when I was just starting to suffer from increasing hearing loss gradually, every year or two, I needed new hearing devices. I had a sudden decline in my hearing ability. Uh, it was suggested that I see an ENT doctor. And I went to an ENT analogy a uh, very qualified doctor affiliated in Manhattan with Mount Sinai. Uh, I checked him out very thoroughly and uh, he assured me that I was not suffering from anything beyond sensory neural hearing loss and referred me to an audiologist. The audiologist happened to be down the hall. Uh, so I was cared for for a couple of years by uh, that audiologist uh, uh, relatively well. Um, my point is, as has been said before or recently by Eric, I, I really don't understand what the purpose of this legislation is. I do understand uh, that, as Mr. Glazer said, we should encourage more people to become audiologists, but I'm not sure this this legislation uh, in any way would affect that. Um, if it's a matter of compensated, 
I think that uh, compensation for audiologists is something that the entire, and dispensers, is something that the entire profession uh, has to deal with uh, and doesn't so much relate to the issue before us. Um, so, you know, if it's 5%, that's a cap on what you can take in, um, then that's a separate issue, it seems to me, also, and should be addressed as such. Thank you, Jerry. Um, looking at my screen, it looks like uh, two other board members have their hands up. Um, according uh, to how it presents on my screen, uh, it looks like Jason has a comment. Yeah, I, I, thank you very much. And um, I want to speak on behalf of myself, not on the education department. Uh, I've, I've worked for the government here in Albany for about 15 years and been a lobbyist for about 15 years. Uh, this legislation is not moving. Uh, I've been wrong before. If you're not sure about that, you can go ask my wife. She'll tell you I'm wrong all the time. However, <laughs> what it looks like to me, this, this is a what we call a one-house bill. This is, it has only one sponsor in one house, and it's been around for 13 years. So for the board members, I wouldn't be concerned. For Dr. Chandra Shaker, John Shaker, sorry, uh, and Mr. Glazer, if you have hired um, representation in Albany and they're telling you this moving and that something's going on with this bill, you should have a hard conversation with them. And again, that's just, I hate to see when Albany does this to people and gets people worked up on both sides of an issue, but um, th th there's nothing happening with this bill in, in my professional opinion. Thank you, Jason. Um, it looks like uh, the next board member on my screen that has their hands up is uh, Mary. Yeah, um, I just wanted to, first of all, thank um, Dr. Chandra Shocker and Mr. Glazer for, for coming in today and, and sharing their viewpoint. Um, I have an interesting perspective, um, much like Eric. I had lived in the southern tier of, of New York um, for a number of years, and access to hearing care is, in fact, an issue. However, Mr. Glazer, you were speaking directly to ENT and allergy being a source of hearing care in, in uh, the largest source. Um, I lived in the Southern Tier. There is no ENT and allergy in the Southern Tier of New York. Um, if you needed hearing health care, typically you went to either Corning or you went to um, Rochester. Um, so I don't see how having an ENT practice such as an allergy is going to have any effect on the consumers in the remainder of the state. Um, what we need to figure out is how to get better access to consumers in the portions of the state where we don't have immediate access to good quality hearing health care. And I know, Eric, you're in upstate New York, um, and I think you could speak to that better than I, but I do know personally living up there, audiologists were few and far between in upstate New York. Go are. It, and that's a problem audiology has. And I don't think ENTs selling hearing aids, hiring an audiologist or dispenser to do so is going to solve that problem. Um, and I think we need to look at the picture of the entire state of New York, not what's referred to as downstate New York, Long Island, New York, Westchester. Um, so maybe we need to look at this issue from a like slightly wider lens. That's all I wanted to say. If I could share a thought I brought this up on the board and I appreciate um, for Dr. Sandra, Sandra Sakar and for uh, Mr. Glazer to, to hear this information I've gotten. I've been doing a study, I'm over six, 700 uh, participants and asking certain questions about how many people had their eyes checked, their teeth checked, their hearing checked. The numbers are staggering, 98%, 99%. Under 40% people getting their hearing checked. And the last question I asked, has your general practitioner spoken to you about hearing health and getting a baseline of hearing? That number is under 10%. My concern is we talk about access. We need our general practitioners and any ENT, podiatrist, optometrist, ophthalmologist to say, hey, you know what? If you have an ophthalmologist saying, hey, you know what, you're not going to get your visual cue because your issues with your vision. Oh, by the way, get your hearing checked to get a baseline. We don't have this happening. So what happens is 
are when customers or excuse me, I don't want to use that word, but that's what it is for some. My clients, my patients, I can't say patients. They come to us when they feel they have a problem instead of being simply informed. Get a baseline. If it shows need of assistance, get help. That doesn't require a physician to have a registration to dispense hearing aids. We need to improve access for patient information about hearing health and when to get help. Because if I understand right, again, I'm not the audiologist, but the longer we go with auditory deprivation, if that's the term I'm allowed to use, or not having auditory sensation by not hearing, it affects how we process. So why have people come to us when they're 70 and 80 when they could have been seen getting help in their 50s? When what happens is we'll see in a couple of years, your hearing's not bad for your age. How can we improve that? That's something I think we could share across the board. I hope that helps. Thank you, Eric. Um, it looks like the next uh, member on my screen who has the hands up is Dr. Kim. Thanks, David. Mm -hmm. well, this has been a really live formative dialogue and you know, that was the purpose of having the two invited speakers. Um, you know, Eric, the Academy, um, we've been working on age-related hearing loss screening with the, with the primary, uh, you know, practitioners, family doctors, geriatrics. Uh, and it, it's a work in progress and I feel that we have to come from multiple angles. Yes. And obviously, you know, this dialogue was you know, just to like educate everybody. How can we expand greater access? How can we work together and leave the monetary, the financial aspect out of it? But obviously, it, it, it's a it's a dialogue in progress. And yeah. um, I, I really thank Dr. Mr. Glazer and uh, Dr. Chandra Sekar for coming and educating the board today. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Uh, it looks like the next board member who has their hand up uh, is Ann or just agree. Yep, Ann. Uh, yes, um, thank you. I think, um, you know, as we wrap up this discussion, um, I think that we're everybody here is on the same page. We want to be able to provide um, service and care to as many individuals in New York State as possible. And I think we're talking about the wrong issue because if we look at the reports on the number of um, registered hearing aid dispensers in New York State that was given earlier by the state representative, we will see that our numbers over time have actually declined. I went through them um, before this meeting. We all know that you know uh, the baby boomers are upon us. There are a lot more people looking for hearing health care now than ever before um, in in history. Um, so you know we're we're spending a lot of time talking about ENTs, dispensing whatever. Really, the problem is we don't have enough. Um, hearing aid dispensers, whether they're working at an ENT office um, or an audiology practice or a private practice. So, you know, if we're really going to help more people, we need more licensed um, hearing aid dispensers in New York State. If not, we're just shuffling people around. To you know, I mean, if ENTs are dispensing out of their office, we still don't have any more providers. We're just shuffling the people, the providers we have, to working for different places. So that's my closing statement, and something that um, you know, perhaps we can discuss at another board meeting is how this board, as a consumer protection board, we want to be able to give people access. Uh, to hearing health care. So how can we get, um, you know, the word out there and try to get more people in in, in uh, dispensing hearing aids in New York State? Thank you. Um, so, and if I can, David, and you're spot on. Mm -hmm. We don't have enough audiologists and hearing aid dispensers. And the fact is, is that 
it's so costly to get the education to get this these days that and New York State and whether you're downstate or upstate very expensive I I went to school in upstate New York I have colleagues ENT colleague practices in Albany in Rochester they cannot recruit audiologists up there because the cost of living is so high the cost of getting the licensing and the education is so high it's become unaffordable to live in New York State and what's happening is we're actually training audiologists in New York State and they're going to Connecticut and Pennsylvania and Florida this is a real patient access issue right mm -hmm. what I can tell you is is that ENT and allergy can support higher salaries for audiologists because we're doing this clinical audiology component that combines with the audiology dispensing. And that's how we're able to come up with salary levels that can attract 125 audiologists and, and licensed practitioners. So that's all I'm advocating is that we're shooting ourselves in the foot here because there aren't enough providers. I looked at that, that same report that was on here and I said, wow, look at the, the, the low number of, of uh, uh, of providers that we're, we're getting ourselves into a bad situation. So it's the patient access issue. I, I really, uh, this is not about selling an extra hearing aid for another 300 bucks. This is about the patient who comes in who really needs help. And, and the longer they wait and cannot get that help, we know that their mental deficiency is gonna go down. I'm not a doctor. I, I'm just a, I'm just Bob trying to provide a great service. So. Um, I'll leave you with that thought. I want to work with you. Just a um, question, Mr. Glazier. Does your program, does your the business, I hate saying business model, do they hire hearing instrument specialists as well? We, we, all of our life, we hire licensed audiologists and require them to take both licensing. Um, oh. uh, right, no, I understand that. My, so my question goes back to, I think you answered it, is hearing instrument specialists are not a part of your group. Um, as uh, well, I can we, tell you, it's we not provide, of, go ahead. Uh, so, so right. I, I'm sorry, Bob, I'm gonna jump in because our audiologists need to be audiologists because we provide a full spectrum of audio vestibular testing. So Agreed. we really need people with, you know, that's why we hire and, and, and work uh, in our offices with doctors of audiology because they are trained to do not just the audiometric testing, but sort of more complicated audiometric testing and all the vestibular testing. Because we really do, like the, the mission is what we all went into, whatever we went into, right, is to provide the best possible whatever care we're giving in a timely fashion, in a compassionate and comprehensive fashion. So that's why we don't, uh, we can't hire hearing instrument specialists because we're trying to provide a full spectrum of, of audiometric and audio vestibular care. I'm not opposed to, so, however, I'm not opposed to that constantly. So, you know, no. I'm, I'm, I'm in this box of, you know, I hire audiologists and they can do dispensing, but, you know, it's getting tougher and tougher to find audiologists. So I would tell you, we all have to rethink what what we're doing in this day and age. So I'm certainly not opposed to that concept. And I appreciate that. You know, like I said, in the Southern tier, we have minimal amount of audiologists and ENTs to accommodate my community. And my concern is access period. Yes. And I don't, and again, it's not a concept. I hate using the phrase funneling Okay, I don't mean it to be in a negative way, but as a hearing instrument specialist, when I'm con when I'm working with somebody that's sensory neural hearing loss, and they qualify to be under my care, or under another hearing instrument specialist care, um, they should ha consumers should have um, the option of choosing where to go, and being on the advisory board, I want that aspect for patients in New York State, consumers in New York State, to make sure they can choose their access, not go from one door to another. And I'm not dismissing that, it's a function that is, it's working, it's happening. 
overall, I'm okay with that. But as you just shared, without hearing instrument specialists that are capable and doing their job. Again, and we get ref we don't get those referrals. They get funneled, and I hate using to particular audiologists. And I'm not saying it's going to diminish a hearing instrument specialist, but I think we all have to work at improving overall access across the board. And I I would like to think that um, changing legislation isn't the way to go. I think we could look at improving salary inputs through different measures, if that's the case. But I think we need to look at getting more audiologists in schools. I understand, um, I asked a number up in Syracuse, I think the number was like 20, 20 audiologists coming out of the next program is what I heard. That's not a lot of audiologists. So we need more hearing health care. And I think New York has a good program for us to be a part of that. And I think we can open that up across the state. Thank and you. collaborative care for ENTs and audiologists. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Eric. Um, so, it, you know, I, I agree with the board members. Um, you know, this has certainly been a very lively discussion. So, I want to thank everybody, um, Dr. Uh, Sandra Shaker, as well as Mr. Glazer. Um, the next item on the agenda is uh, just confirming the next uh, meeting date, uh, Thursday, December 22nd at 1 p.m. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Um, before the next meeting, uh, the department will obviously provide notice uh, to the board members and provide notice on our website. Um, the next item is something that I believe Eric and some of the other board members requested at the last meeting was an official um, portion of the open meeting to allow for public comment. Um, at this point, if there are any members of the public that would like uh, to make a comment uh, before the board, uh, please indicate by uh, raising your hand. It uh, looks like uh, Barbara Ahern has your hand up, so I'm going to unmute you. Thank you and um, welcome. Thank you. Am I unmuted? Yes, we can hear you. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. Um, and I, I appreciate the, uh, the opportunity um, to provide some public comment uh, on the item that you've just finished discussing. And that is legislation that would uh, permit physicians, um, ENTs, otolaryngologists to dispense hearing aids, which uh, is not currently allowed uh, under the law, uh, except in within the um, restrictions that I think you have already talked about. I, I represent the um, Hearing Healthcare Alliance, uh, which is an organization composed of uh, dispensers, both audiologist dispensers and non-audiologist dispensers. We were one of the groups that uh, worked for years to rewrite that article in the general business law uh, that currently governs the way that all hearing aid dispensers uh, must operate. And it is uh, talked about all the time and was talked about uh, today at this meeting. Um, though those discussions involved dispensers, audiologists, it represented the um, organization that represents audiologists only, NISHLA, the New York State Speech Language Hearing Association, uh, which I believe Anne is a member of, um, was an important part of those discussions. So uh, everyone had an opportunity to talk about what was important. We had a lot of consumer groups in those discussions, not the one that Jerry is affiliated with, uh, but, but I think that the predecessor organization and many other general consumer organizations. And the concern was really about consumers. So the law was written to provide a lot of consumer protections. And I think Jerry reminds us all the time when those consumer protections are not being provided to people uh, getting a hearing aid or seeing a provider 
uh, with questions about hearing aids. Um, so when I deliver the course tomorrow uh, on New York state and federal uh, laws and regulations and professional conduct, uh, because the Hearing Healthcare Alliance starts its meeting tomorrow, um, I will certainly emphasize all the things that Jerry wants emphasized that dispensers <laughs> must do. But I think we have some, some strong concerns that the legislation, both bills that you have brought before the advisory board, David, uh, do not really provide those consumer protections. And you have, I think, answered Anne's inquiry uh, that the, the one bill that is very simple is just an amendment to section 80, 802 allowing physicians to dispense uh, does not require them to do anything uh, that other dispensers must do that are all of the uh, consumer protections and consumer services that we work so hard for. So I'm not sure that that is in anyone's best interest. The other bill, which is, as we have said, a pilot program for Westchester County only, uh, was, I believe, introduced at the request of ENT and Allergy. Um, and you heard from, uh, from two of their employees here today. And I would point out that that bill also does not provide the consumer protections that are so important because what it talks about and in this pilot program that, as you said, David, might at the end of the five year pilot program period be continued or expanded to the rest of the state. It allows a licensed audiologist employed by an ENT um, to dispense hearing aids to someone that has been seen by the medical part of the practice. There is no requirement in that bill that the licensed audiologist be a registered hearing aid dispenser. So I appreciate uh, Mr. Glazer saying that the business model followed by ENT and allergy is to require that, but that's not what he is putting in place with the legislation that his lobbyist has introduced and has introduced for the last several years. Um, and we are strongly opposed to both of those bills. Jason, I, I wish I could agree with you that these bills are never going anywhere. The pilot program bill was passed in the Senate in 2019, the first year that it was introduced. Uh, it took us a little bit by surprise. We have worked very hard. Nishla has worked very hard to make sure that that bill is not passed, but it will continue to be introduced. It is a continuing battle, and there is actually um, one member of the assembly who chairs the Assembly Higher Education Committee, Jason, I'm sure you know her very well, um, who is strongly opposed to this idea uh, and and she has been instrumental in making sure that that bill is not considered in the assembly. Um, and she did work very hard to defeat it in that committee when it came up in committee a few years ago. I'm not sure if she is going to continue in the assembly. I'm not sure if she is going to continue as chair of that committee. Things in the legislature are very fluid all the time. So I think it is very important to look hard at these bills and what they would do. And they, they, they may provide uh, additional providers for people with hearing needs, with hearing health needs, but they also may not. Um, Peter Fisher mentioned uh, Betty Little, uh, who was a Senator, no longer a Senator, she had a similar bill that she had introduced when she served in the Senate. She tried to find a way that it could be um, something that 
dispensers and audiologists and physicians could agree with. And we did have a round table meeting at which uh, an ENT from the capital district region did in fact say in front of all of us, um, this is a profit center for my medical practice and that's why I need this legislation. And if, if you listen to those ENTs, those MDs who view it that way, it's not everyone, but there's nothing in the legislation that prevents those people from serving consumers and none of the bills that are brought before this advisory board would do anything to help consumers. And there are members of the Hearing Healthcare Alliance who get people walking into their place of business uh, and saying, I have a hearing aid that I got from an audiologist. Here's my receipt. I've seen this. Um, it is a one page business receipt. It is not the extensive uh, agreement that is required under the general business law, and it was an audiologist employed by an ENT practice down in New York City. Uh, checking the Department of State's database, it was an audiologist who was not a licensed dispenser. This was maybe, it was, it was immediately pre-pandemic, so let's say it's three years ago, but that is also going on out there. That is what we fear uh, with all of the legislation that has been introduced to date. And that is a big reason why we oppose those bills. The other reason why the members of the Hearing Healthcare Alliance oppose those bills is because it may not do what you're talking about as the, the most important thing that needs to be done, and that is increasing providers. And one of the biggest problems that we talked about in that meeting a few years ago with Senator Betty Little was the fact that under current New York state law, uh, dispensers are required to inform everyone that it is in their best interest to see a physician, uh, preferably uh, an otolaryngologist uh, before they are fitted for a hearing aid. Sure, there's a waiver, uh, many dispensers use the waiver, many of them don't. Many of them do feel that people should go to see a physician first. And many, many, um, many of the uh, physicians, otolaryngologists, who have now hired uh, audiologists or put um, a uh, a dispensing business into their practice when they are finished seeing this person that's been sent to them by a dispenser complying with existing law. They say, yes, you need a hearing aid and please go down the hall and get one. And they do not send them back to the dispenser that followed the law and recommended to, to their client that they go see an otolaryngologist. That is not going to increase the providers, it is going to decrease the providers. Uh, and that's, that's an ethical matter. It's nothing that can be legislated. It is why Senator Betty Little decided that she would not pursue that legislation because she couldn't find any way of requiring otolaryngologists who were sent someone um, by a dispenser to be required to send that person back to the provider that was the original uh, hearing health professional consulted um, by that person. So I've, I've probably gone on longer than I should. I know that Barbara Kruger um, also wants to talk, um, but I urge you um, individually and with all of the organizations that you do represent uh, on this board or privately, not part of the board, um, to to oppose what what is at the bottom of of these bills that would allow physicians to dispense and to dispense for a profit, unless there is significant change 
made to those proposals that would provide uh, fairness and would provide consumers with all of the consumer protections that they are currently receiving under the law. Thank you, um, Ms. Kruger. I see you have your hands up. I believe you're unmuted. Good. Hi, it's, it's Barbara Kruger and Dr. Kruger and whatever. Fred. I'm an audiologist, and you know I've been on the board and now have been off the board. But I'm thrilled to have finally some discussion about dispensing and the care of patients instead of just the numbers. So this was a very good discussion. I couldn't agree more strongly with Barbara Ahern and any business, any business that is involved at all in the dispensing of hearing aids, all professionals in that business should be licensed as hearing aid dispensers. They may also be licensed as audiologists or physicians, but they must be licensed as hearing aid dispensers and they should be required to take mandated continuing education. That's it. Uh, there should that should be changed, modified somehow through the dispensing board. Get run it through and put out an opposing bill. I suspect you will get support from the professional agencies. Uh, the other is uh, following up on some of the discussion about getting the the uh, email addresses. For all, send an email, send a letter out. You must send back an email. This is the way we will be continuing to contact you and and remind them then that the sign regarding counseling about assisted devices and 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 telecoils and so forth must be in their office. It must be in their their contracts that uh, you know all the things that are in the key key points in the law that were addressed that need to be. Uh, they need to be reminded about and handing out the brochures that are appropriate with regard to the proper care and delivery of service for hearing uh, people with hearing issues. Thank you for being able to speak. Thank you for joining us. Um, looking around um, the WebEx screen just to see if there's anyone else, uh, either from the public or the board uh, that would like uh, to say anything further, uh, Jerry, have your hand up. Thank you. Um, I don't know if you were going to introduce uh, new business at this point, but I did want to make an announcement. Uh, yesterday, the Senate unanimously approved S1852. Uh, the bill had previously been passed unanimously by the Assembly. The two bills now go to the governor for signature. This would create for the first time New York State as having a commission for the deaf, deaf, blind, and hard of hearing. Uh, it really is a landmark piece of legislation. New York is one of only 12 states that uh, regrettably has not had a voice for these groups of disabilities in Albany. And therefore, it's been impossible for a lot of the legislation we've been talking about to get legislators informed and educated about how consumers feel and what consumers face. So I just wanted to tell everybody how pleased the Hearing Loss Association is our coalition of the deaf, deaf, blind, and hard of hearing is. And um, let's all give thanks for that. And I think it'll be a source in years to come for input that can be valuable to this group. That's certainly uh, good news. Thanks for the update, Gary. Um, just looking around again, doesn't appear as if any members of the public or board have their hands up. Uh, so I believe that concludes uh, the items on today's agenda. Um, would any voting member of the board like to make a motion to adjourn? I'll make a motion to adjourn. Okay, thank I'll you. second. Uh, thank you. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone Aye. opposed?
there being no opposition. Um, and then today's meeting of the hearing aid advisory board is closed. Thank you to all the members and DOS staff and public for participating. And uh, we'll see everybody again in September. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye bye, Jerry. Bye. Again, Peter. Happy <laughs> fishing. <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. <laughs>